Okay, so it's 12.30. I think I will quite informally get the thing started by introducing Roy. Hello. Uh, Roy, well, uh, as you see it here, I mean, he, he's both a collector and a lawyer, but he comes here as a collector. Well, if you have and any legal work. <laughs> um, and we have been in touch. I visited his office thinking about getting items, and he actually loaned us a beautiful, uh, beautiful set of photos of Guangzhou in the 1850s that we use for our exhibition upstairs on uh, Hong Kong and Canton at the time of the Opium War. Uh, beside that, uh, we also have a special collection, but obviously special collection in a library is a place that we treasure, we visit, we display in exhibition, and then we get items from collectors, and we collaborate from collectors, and at the same time, collectors have their own approach and their own joy in building their own collection according to their own personality. So this is why we leave it now to Roy to talk about this dimension. Um, Thank you very much, Marco, Diana, Victoria. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I'm not going to use a mic. Hopefully, my voice will carry. So I have about 45 minutes, I'm told. And one of the things that I hope to convey is the excitement that I feel about this stuff, these little pieces of paper that hopefully pile up and amount to uh, something. I got started about seven years ago, fairly late in life. I've been collecting like a madman and practicing law at the same time. Not always an easy thing to do. And when I got started, um, my focus was books, I would say. And a lot of books dealing with the West and China, China being the overriding theme. And I also decided, well, you know, I really have to go back to the 15th century, the 16th century, the Jesuits, uh, uh, because I need to collect sort of the fundamental canon of the intercourse between the West and China. But I think like most collectors, your interests evolve over time, and your budget is only so much. So that also provides somewhat of a constraint. But you sort of end up where you should end up. And what happened to me was I became much less interested from a collecting perspective in really anything before the 19th century. And my collection is largely 20th century. Within that, largely the Republican era from 1911 to 1949. But for Hong Kong stuff, I go way beyond 1949. I also collect PRC stuff. And I'm also interested, being an American, in the Chinese experience in the United States. And because of that, I got on the board of a great museum in Chinatown in New York City called the Museum of Chinese in America. So a couple of comments before we jump in. Every collection, every collector is different. I would call myself a wide bore, sometimes too wide bore collector. You may run into collectors and they're map people, or they're 19th century China trade painting people. That is not moi. Uh, I have interests that span a lot of different areas. So if you come to my office, you will see maps. You probably won't see too much in the way of trade paintings, but you will see photos, you will see posters, you'll see letters, you'll see movie tickets, you'll see programs, you'll see city directories, diaries, you know, you name it. The other change, I spoke about a temporal change, that is Hey, let's forget about you know, the 18th and 17th centuries, because you've got to concentrate a little bit, even when you're a wide board collector. The other change is sort of what I collect. And that is, 
while I still buy books, um, I am much, much more interested in what we call ephemera. And ephemera is a very, very broad term. What's ephemera? Ephemera means something that is of the time. It wasn't necessarily intended to endure. What is the most ephemeral piece of ephemera? It would be your movie ticket, right? You'd go to the movies in Shanghai in 1939 to watch the debut of Gone with the Wind, not realizing that that ticket, you know, 90 years later, 80 years later, has value. And you take that ticket and you probably chuck it, you know? Um, that I would call is the most ephemeral example of ephemera. But there's a, a spectrum of ephemera. This is Roy Delvick's definition. This is not any classical definition. There's more durable ephemera. Let's say that 1937 St. John's University, Shanghai yearbook. Now, that yearbook would be succeeded in 1938 by the next year's yearbook. Or the Chronicle and Directory for Hong Kong and all of these places, this massive tome. You wouldn't throw away the earlier year's directory or the earlier year's uh, yearbook, but it was of that time. So when we talk about ephemera, people use that term very broadly. I just want to convey that there is a range of ephemera, and I try to go where I can with ephemera. So let's jump in. That's the wrong thing, and let's go down here. Oh, Tracy, help, help. Okay, here we are. Okay, so I have a law office, so to speak, and I actually do practice law. And as I was saying before, you know, I am a beneficiary, although I cannot stand Donald Trump, I am a beneficiary of the trade war between the two countries because that's the kind of thing that I do, advising people. Uh, and I do actually have some legal files in here, but this is, this is my office. Uh, and I'm trying to organize because I've been so busy acquiring that I really haven't spent a lot of time organizing. So one of the first things that I'm trying to do is to get all my Shanghai materials. So this whole row is Shanghai material. So you walk in and it doesn't look like you're normal if there is a normal law office. And Marco, I throw out the invitation, maybe we can have some small groups come over because it's one thing for me to talk about it, it's another thing for you guys to see it. Okay, let's jump in. So December 25th, 1941, um, Hong Kong surrendered. So if you are an enemy national, you're waiting for the next shoe to drop. You know that you're off to some internment camp. Enemy national would be British passport holders, US passport holders, uh, Dutch, whatever. This is the next shoe dropping. This is an order from the Imperial Japanese Gendarmerie because the Japanese, I think, modeled their police after the French. And it's basically telling all enemy civilians, and let's think about that, that would be anyone who is not part, a national, uh, not of an Axis country, so non-Germans, non-Italians, I guess non-Austrians, uh, French who could yeah, go either way, uh, to basically line up uh, at the Murray Parade Ground, which is where the, I think the Murray Building, the Peak Tram is, on the fifth day of January 1942. This was issued on January 4th, 1942. You can imagine the sort of the terror, the apprehension that this produced, because this was the first step on the way to Stanley internment camp if you were a civilian, uh, or to Sham Shui Po and what, Argyle Street, if you were in the military. So it's a very simple piece of paper, only on one side, but one of the things that I really like is how a simple piece of paper is so fraught, is so potentially laden with emotion. And I'll get to that a little bit more. Hope to show that a bit more. Um, what am I pressing here? Okay. Tracy, help. Okay. Okay. Now I'm going the other way. Go the other way. Which is not sure. Okay, now, yeah. now we come should down. Be the okay. This Talk about emotion. Um, 
Marco Polo Bridge, July 1937. China fights alone, essentially for four years, four years, until Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941. So we're talking about China basically slugging it out with a superior opponent for four and a half years. Shanghai was kind of an interesting case because while the Japanese took over the Chinese part of Shanghai, they did not take over the foreign concessions. So the British concession, the um, French concession. So this is a letter from a gentleman named Z.V. Lee, who's head of a Christian organization in Shanghai. And it's very interesting. It, it's a letter that is written to every graduating senior, every graduating senior of the 1939 class of Shanghai American School, every graduating senior. And the um, reason stated in the letter is, you know, you've come to this juncture in your life, you're 18 years old, we want to um, have you take a look at this booklet, which I'll get to in the next slide, and just think about it, reflect on it. So let's look at the booklet. Um, I'm going to go back and forth here. This booklet came with a letter, and this booklet was intended to be distributed at a Christian student youth conference in Amsterdam in 1939. And the purpose of this booklet was for the Chinese students attending in Amsterdam to tell the world how they were suffering at the hands of the Japanese. Now, let's think, in 1939, America was not at war with Japan. America was, in fact, supplying Japan with a lot of the petroleum, uh, steel, other materials, some of which had to be turned against the Chinese people. And why send it to every graduating senior of the 1939 class of SAS? Because maybe, maybe that kid's father, sorry, it was unlikely to be his mother or her mother, maybe that kid's father worked for U.S. Steel. Maybe that kid's father worked for, you know, Meifu, Standard Oil Company of New York. And maybe this is something that could be passed. So this booklet is essentially an entreaty, an entreaty by the student who completed this booklet, knowing that he or she was writing to an 18-year-old American. So the student filled this booklet out, and here's the booklet, uh, Shang Something Ying, the address, and says, to my friend, I am a student of China, and I don't know who will receive this little book. But for my country and peace of the world, I cannot help writing to you. I mean, I have to write to you. If only you, the American people, can stop the Japanese aggression, the Japanese can fight so long depending upon your gasoline and iron. When there are no things to support Japanese, there is no war existed. Please tell your countrymen that we shall fight to death for saving goes on. And then the last page, I live for China, I die for China, and this kid may have. I tell you, I have a friend who wears his heart on the sleeve, and he's been a big supporter of my collection. And I said, hey, Nick, come on over. He lives in Taipei, he has a, his own law firm. And I said, Nick, I'm going to do two things here, because he gets very excited about the collection. I'm going to give you an oxygen tank, so you, know, you don't have a heart attack. And I'm going to give you a box of Kleenex, because I'm going to show you something that's very emotional. And when he got to the end of this, he was crying. Again, because it's not like many of the events that are depicted in these items are within the living memory of but it's the memory of parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles and, again, the power of a piece of paper. Okay, one of the things as a collector you feel constantly is a sense of incompleteness and a sense of absolute idiocy. Why have I embarked on this path? I'm trying to collect the uncollectible. There's so much stuff out there, so much stuff out there. How can I, as this little whatever, compete with more well-heeled more well -heeled collectors, 
um, or just wrap my arms around everything. So there's like an insecurity, incompleteness, I don't know, maybe I'll see my psychiatrist and he'll explain it more fully. But, but sometimes even the smallest collector can come across things that nobody else has. And that sort of is the reaffirmation, keep going, keep going, keep going. Case in point is this item. Backstory, uh, I was at Yale uh, about four years ago. Yale, uh, familiar to someone in this room at least, um, has the greatest collection of China missionary um, material, largely housed in the Divinity School. I was over at the Divinity School talking to a very well-known person in the area named Martha Smalley, who's written about the Nanking Massacre and other things. And she said, Roy, do you want to walk the stacks? And so I said, sure, Martha. <clears throat> so she takes me down a few aisles. And there is, I guess in library terms, linear foot after linear foot of missionary material. And if you remember the Beatles song, I think it was John Lennon, here I stand feeling 10 feet small, it's yeah, under my head against the wall, I'm thinking, oh man, what am I doing? You know, so I sort of slinked away, oh, thank you, Martha, this is great, you know. I get back to Hong Kong, and I realized, well, I knew, but I remembered that I had this book. So what's this book? This book is the recollections of my life, Eliza Bridgman, with my husband, Elijah Bridgman. Who's Elijah Bridgman? One of the first US missionaries to uh, Hong Kong. He arrived before the colony in Macau. He started the Chinese Repository, which was the first recurring magazine for sinologists about 1834, ran for about 20 years. He wrote grammar books, the Chinese Christomathy. He was what I would call not just a Bible thumper, but a wide bore missionary, a real sinologist. His first wife died. I mean, the mortality rates were just terrible around those times. He gets married in 1845 at the cathedral, which is the predecessor cathedral to St. John's Cathedral. And he was working at a school, which I believe is the Morrison School, whose Morrison is the first missionary. He translated the Bible into Chinese. He never made it to China. He was in Malacca. His school moved to Macau, and then I guess it was at Morrison Hill uh, in Hong Kong. So it was essentially run by American, American missionaries. There was a Bridgman, uh, there was a Samuel Bonney, and there was another guy whose name will come to me in a moment, a Brown from Yale. Um, Yung Wing. Yung Wing, the first Chinese graduate of an American university, he went through the Morrison School. As a matter of fact, Brown shepherded him over to Yale. He graduated in 1854. Um, so, Bridgman remarries. Elijah marries Eliza. It's a little confusing. <laughs> Elijah predeceases um, Eliza. And Eliza Bridgman is a force in her own right. She started a school in Peking called the Bridgman School for Girls, one of the first girls' schools in China, which was still going until World War II time, because I have a friend whose mother went to the Bridgman School. Um, anyway, I bought this book, you know, kind of my life with my husband. And the vendor in Australia said, you know, Roy, there's something really special about this book. At the back of this book is an envelope. And in this envelope are four strips of paper comprising, in totality, a letter written by a student at the Morrison School who attended the wedding. And it's a recounting of the wedding. And you read the letter, you can sort of piece it together. And it's amazing because um, it's just describing you know, the marriage but also talking about some of the personages who came. Dr. James Legge, or Leg, however you pronounce it, the great Confucian translator. Uh, Peter Parker, not Spider-Man, but the, uh, one of the original or first uh, American diplomats who's also an eye doctor at the Canton Eye Hospital, which I think in some form continues until today. And he talks about people arriving by horseback. 
people arriving uh, by boat. And he talks about the reverend at the time, Reverend Stanton. You can look him up. There's a Reverend Stanton who had the kids in a choir, some sing alto and some sing bass. And he said, I think this is a really beautiful thing to do. And I had this letter. And I said, hey, I'm going to send this to Martha. And I sent a copy. And she said, can we put this in our Bridgman file? And I went, ah. Oh. <laughs> can there be anything better? So that sort of uh, uh, reaffirmed um, my belief in collecting and, and continuing. OK, Chinese Labor Corps. I know I'm jumping around, but that's what collectors do, or at least what I do. We jump around. I never heard of the Chinese Labor Corps. What is the Chinese Labor Corps? And the Chinese Labor Corps is important not only because of the experience of 140,000 Chinese laborers from Shandong largely, who went over to France largely during World War I, about 100,000 under the British, 40,000 under the French. And there, the idea was that these laborers would do the kinds of things, you know, work maybe in a cafeteria or at a dock or uh, in a factory that would free up the local men to be slaughtered. But whatever, that was the idea. And What's interesting about this, and you know, I don't cast myself as a historian, I know a few things, is from my understanding, in World War I, China really had no dog in the fight. China could have credibly, I think, sided with the Germans. China decided not to, and there were a whole host of reasons. China said, hey, we'll be an ally of the allies, of the Brits and then the Americans, and the Japanese, of course, because the Japanese were fighting against the Germans in World War I, which will lead me to another slide. So they had no dog in the fight, but they made a decision. So here you have these laborers. They chose most of them, I think, from Shandong because of the idea that the climate in Shandong was more or less similar to what it was going to be like in France. And the, I, maybe they felt that people in Shandong are a little bit bigger than scrawnier people from the south, physique-wise, and they would do better in a harsher climate. Hard to say. But anyway, these guys go over. They're illiterate. They're illiterate. They're not soldiers, but they're under military control. I had no idea when I started collecting. Never heard of the Chinese Labor Corps. And I read a book by another Yale, John Hersey, uh, who wrote uh, Hiroshima. Pulitzer Prize winner. Uh, and John Hersey is a Mish kid. What's a Mish kid? A Mish kid is the son of a missionary kid, or son of a missionary born in China. And there are some amazing Mish kids, including Hersey and other folks. Thornton Wilder, well, he wasn't a Mish kid, but we'll go on. Anyway, um, so Hersey wrote a book about the call, which was in a very appropriate name. And the call is about the call that students at campuses in the UK, in the US felt, we're going to go to China and we're going to convert these people. It was evangelized China in our generation. And you know, we can sort of think, oh man, these people were like nuts. But you really have to admire some of the things that they did. <clears throat> and in the call, <clears throat> um, Percy's protagonist, who is a compositor, Percy's father and somebody else, goes to France during World War I from China. He's working for the Y, the YMCA. And the idea is literacy. And this literacy was very important because it was a push that was behind the May 4th movement, that how do we bring the language down to the local level so that people, so that the writing uh, reflects how people speak and not how Confucius spoke you know, 20 centuries ago. So anyway. I thought, wow, as a collector, this is really interesting. Can I ever find something about the uh, Chinese Labor Corps? And would you know it, there is a vendor, a book dealer in the UK, who just happened to have four or five pieces on the Chinese Labor Corps. And I got four of them, or three or four, or something like that. One that I didn't get, an ophthalmologist got, because there's some dis eye disease that is particular to people from Shandong, I forget the name of it, that's very serious. But I think I got the best thing. And this is essentially <clears throat> a human resources manual. 
a human resources manual <clears throat> for a British officer who's trying to deal with these guys in France who don't speak any English, and he sure as hell didn't speak any Chinese. Now, there were Y interpreters. That's another role that the Y played in France. But like all good human resources manuals, at the top it says, all previous instructions canceled. <laughs> I've never seen a human resource manual, that, and I've drafted some, that said anything else but that this supersedes and replaces every previous human resources manual. And it's August 4th, 1917, and it talks about what these guys were paid. Interpreters, field interpreters, the ganger is the head of a group of um, CLC workers. They were paid so much in France, so much back home, and this goes on for about six or seven pages, when they could take sick leave with pay, sick leave without pay. It's just an amazing document that brings to life what this phenomenon was. And it was a phenomenon. Now, what happened to these guys? Um, the British uh, CLC folks, the 100,000, were under slightly tighter control. Most of them, I think, or all of them went back. But the French, always with the French, it's a bit looser. They had fewer, and the French had lost so many men. I think about 6,000 of them stayed, married French women, buried in French cemeteries, kids, grandkids, whatever. So, ah, picture. This is a picture that tells a 1,000 words. That's Governor Grantham. He was the first post-war governor of Hong Kong after Mark Young. Mark Young was the governor who had the misfortune of surrendering at the Peninsula Hotel. Um, and that is T.V. Song's wife. T.V. Song uh, was a sister of Madame Chiang Kai, brother of Madame Chiang Kai-shek, um, Song Mei Ling. And I love this picture. They're exiting from Happy Valley, and she exhibits so much power. She was a quite large, imposing woman. And it's almost like Governor Grantham is her manservant. You know, excuse me, could you please pay the driver? I'm not carrying any money. This is about 1948, exiting Happy Valley. So this is a picture that really does tell you in a thousand words. You just look at the picture. You may not know who the people are. But then I look at this picture, and this is a picture that is absolutely not worth a thousand words because you look at these guys, they look so happy. You know, they're eating hot dogs and he's sipping a Coke. And this is at a stand, a vending stand in New York City. But then you read the real story. These are the first Chinese seamen who have been released into the United States or let in the United States. Because this is the time of the Chinese Exclusion Act. It was very, very difficult for the Chinese to emigrate to the United States. And they're surrounded by guards. You know, while they're eating their hot dog and having their Coke, you don't see the guards. So sometimes the picture tells you everything. Sometimes the picture simply does not tell you enough. <clears throat> this is what I would call a press photo. Press photos are great because not only do you get a, a, an original vintage print, it may be all beat up. So this was done for you know, uh, various press agencies that might be sold to magazines. But you get the stuff on the back that describes the context. And sometimes the context is off. Ah, why can't go home for Xmas and New Year? Capitalist oppression. This is a banner from the Korean War, brought home by a US Korean War vet, gotten from the Chinese. Um, I guess there was some battle. They left this banner behind. The interesting thing is this is a repurposed banner because it was a rice sack. On the other side, you see Nanking rice or whatever. Uh, the Korean War is, even in the States, I don't know, in China, is a largely forgotten war, and it's a largely uncollected war. But the propaganda of the Korean War is quite interesting. The US and the UN propaganda for the Chinese and North Korean soldiers was largely, you're hungry, you're cold, you're going to die. Something like that. Something like that. The Chinese propaganda, even though the food is better, the Chinese food, it didn't appeal to the better food. It was much more psychological, including propaganda aimed at African-American soldiers, the line of which was something like, you're colored, I'm colored. 
your fight is not with me. Your fight is back home with the system that oppresses you. And you read it and you go, yeah, yeah, they're right, they're right. <laughs> and the other thing you, you, you think when you read this is, it was probably written by someone who went to an American school in China, because we're talking 50, 51, 52. So there is this great irony to some of the Chinese propaganda. Ah, the things you don't know about. I'm a big sports fan, and I love collecting material about Chinese athletes. I gave a talk a few months ago to the Royal Asiatic Society on Chinese athletes. I had no idea, I had no idea that in 1948, there was a Chinese Canadian guy named Larry Kwong, who just died, who played one minute, one minute in an NHL National Hockey League game for the New York Rangers. He made it to the top for one minute. That's it. <laughs> but he made it to the top. The first Chinese, Asian, to ever play in the National Hockey League. And this is the questionnaire that he submitted to the Rangers, talking about his background. He was a little guy, but hockey players aren't necessarily that big, five feet six, 150 pounds, Chinese, and I saw this when I went, <laughs> but just kind of a very interesting piece of uh, Chinese Canadian sports history. And there's the envelope. So he just died earlier this year, about age 93, 94. History coming alive, but history coming alive for someone who's just died. And that is Boxer Rebellion. This is the inventory, the inventory of personal effects on death of an American soldier. He was a bugler, pop, 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 killed in Tianjin, I think a bullet in the head. And poncho, um, shirts, toothbrushes, you know, tobacco, whatever. This is something I think that the Army had to fill out by regulation. But again, it, you know, you can talk about the Boxer Rebellion and you can talk about the 55-day siege and you can talk about, you know, the Boxers thinking that they were invulnerable and, uh, you know, what was the Qing Dynasty doing, playing both sides of the fence. But you see something like this, a sad thing, but it, again, it just animates history, I think. Ah, another animator of history. Okay, going back to uh, World War I era. What happened in World War I was that the Germans were in uh, Qingdao, or Tsingtao, uh, the Japanese fighting with the Brits and the Americans took Qingdao back. Well, they took it. They didn't give it back right away. Um, so we have the peace conference at Versailles, and the expectation of the Chinese people was, hey, we're going to get Qingdao back. But it didn't work out that way for various reasons, some of which can be laid at the feet of the Chinese government, uh, the earlier Chinese government at least. And rightfully so, the Chinese students and general populace were really ticked off, really ticked off because they got such a crappy deal at Versailles, thinking, hey, we gave you 140,000 people, the Chinese Labor Corps. Don't we deserve something in return? Now, Qingdao was eventually returned, quote unquote, I think in about 1922, but still, the sting was there. So, you know, you read about this, you read about this and you say, oh, yeah, 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 but here is a living representation of why a student at Beida would be so mad that on May 4th, you start marching, May 4th, 1919. This is dated March 7th, 1919, and it is sort of like an entry pass for an American veterinarian, I think he was attached to the American military in the Philippines, to go visit Qingdao. So it's sort of like your neighbor sets up in your backyard and says, you need a pass now to come into your backyard. And naturally, that would kind of enrage me. Uh, and it enraged, you know, the, the Chinese students. Hong Kong News. This was the rag, literally a rag, that was published uh, under the Japanese occupation. The front side was how great the war was going for the Japanese. 
not too good. I mean, this is already 1945 January. The backside was Hong Kong news. And you can see Chinese pastor strongly condemns U.S. airmen's savage bombing on Wan Chai. Remember, the bomb was just, there was a bomb that was recently uncovered in Wan Chai. Um, and one of the things I always think about when I look at this paper, I've got a few issues, is if we look at the advertisement, it's arts, tailoring of distinction. Okay, this is January 1945. There's a guy named Art, I assume, who's advertising. Eight months later, the war's over. What happened to Art? Do you think people were a little unhappy that art was advertising in this Japanese-controlled uh, newspaper? No, maybe art was a Japanese tailor. I don't know. But things like this just provoke inquiry. You want to know more. Um, upheaval in Hong Kong. This is a, a pamphlet. It's interesting because it's one of two or three left-wing pamphlets on the uh, 67 riots. And this is so eerie. A roll of honor, patriots who achieved martyrdom. Name, date martyr, place of martyrdom, Wong Tai Sin police station, manner of martyrdom, beaten to death. It is simply another perspective than the one that you know, I would normally see. So I'm looking for perspectives. I, I don't have to find stuff that just agrees with, you know, what I agree with. Um, Hong Kong had a serious refugee problem uh, post-war. It continued. 1958 or 59, I think, was the year of the refugee, the UN year of the refugee. So there were people from all over the world who were contributing things to Hong Kong, Hong Kong kids, families. And CARE was one of the organizations. And this is a booklet of slips. Uh, the name of the contributor, and then the student's letter back, thanking. So it would be interesting to trace these kids. I have about 60 or 70 of these slips. Ah, the Nixon trip. So if you're an American, the single most important event in U.S.-China history is the Nixon trip in 1972, because that opened everything up. The U.S. had not had relations with China for 23 years, and you can say that sort of laid the basis even for Deng Xiaoping going to, you know, Shenzhen in whatever year it was. So here we have a letter from a famous person talking about the, one of the events that made the person famous. I don't have the incoming letter from Mr. Adler, but he presumably wrote to Nixon saying, great trip. You know, it's really helping the world order. So Nixon writes, you know, my recent homecoming is all great. I can say with confidence that my discussions with the leaders of the People's Republic of China have given us the tools to strengthen the structure for an enduring world peace. And now follows the phrase that I think is so telling and so relevant today. One, a peace that is more than the mere absence of war. Peace is not one condition. Peace is a spectrum of conditions. There is a cold peace, a cold peace, where using cold to be unfriendly peace, where my hand is on my gun, Marco's hand is on his gun, and at any moment we may fire at each other. We're at peace, but we're pretty close to war. And then there is the true peace. And his, that phrase illustrates the fact that, that peace is on a continuum. And we look at the relations between the two countries today, where are we? Pan Am had one of the press planes, flew one of the press planes. Uh, there were two planes carrying the press uh, that accompanied Nixon. And this is a bag that Pan Am produced. What's interesting about the bag, it's, it's the iconic Pan Am bag with the white uh, the logo, the white piping, is the visit of President Richard M. Nixon to the People's Republic of China. There's no date on the back. Why is there no date on the bag? Well, it could be because the date of the trip changed, and you have a manufacturing cycle. You, you have to start cutting the leather for the bag. Or it could be that they did not want the people in the factory to know the date. Or maybe there are other reasons. And then, and this is what makes collecting interesting, because you collect one thing, and then you collect things around the thing. This is a school report by a girl named Samantha B, written 17 years after the Nixon trip. And she's saying, it was made by a company that was owned by my mom's uncle Jack. It was the official presidential travel bag. And this is what 
kind of fills out the whole story. It's almost as good as the bag in the letter. <laughs> so we have letter from famous person writing about a famous event. We then can have a letter from a famous person writing about something that's very, what's the word, quotidian, you know, nothing special. So for example, I have a letter from uh, Matthew Nathan, Hong Kong's only Jewish governor, uh, and he is accepting a birthday party invitation. It's still a great letter. It's on, you know, government house letterhead. The best letter by my lights is a letter from a non-famous person who was caught up in a famous event. You could almost say sideswipe. So look at this letter, Tsinghua College, Peking. Look at the date, May 15th, 1919. So you know where I'm heading. It's from uh, an American. He's an instructor of French at Peking. He's writing to a Millie back in the States, and it's your typical, oh, I've been in you know, China, Hong Kong. I'm having a great time until you get to the second paragraph. I am back again in China now and have done almost a year's work. Indeed, we have finished our work for the year because the students went on strike two weeks ago and refused to attend classes. So we've been having a lazy time this last fortnight. How did May 4th affect Arnold? He got off early. The people of China are much disgusted at the result of the peace. And he goes on to explain. I mentioned Yong Wing. Sorry for you. This is the catalog of officers and students of Yale College. Yale College. There he is, the first US graduate, Yong Wing Macau. He wasn't born in Macau, but he spent part of his childhood there. That's a duplicate. Ah, we have so many medals that are issued which reflect strife between, you know, the West and China or the West and Hong Kong. Here's a, I don't want to say it's a happy medal because it's a sad event, but at least it, it depicts people helping each other. In Hong Kong, there was a plague in 1894, largely struck the Chinese community uh, in Tsai Ing-wen, and there were British officers who cleared the bodies. This is the plague medal. This is issued to one of the British officers. On the side of the medal, you can't see it, the officer's name is etched, impressed, or whatever the word is. So I'm not going to say it's a happy medal because it's a terrible event, but at least it's a medal that depicts cooperation rather than slaughter. Um, a very cool map. And the, it, it's interesting because the, the title of the map is so grim. Map showing flood, drought, storm, and insect plague areas in Hobei and Northwest Shandong, 1939. But the style of the map is so lively. You know, you, you can almost feel the flies <laughs> going around the map. Uh, and this was to raise money. 40 US cents coin will feed one man one month. Um, calendars. Um, these calendars are filled in by this Italian fellow, this diplomat, Stefanelli. And some people will say, oh, I want to buy my things pristine. I like it when it's used. I mean, I like to see notations. So having a calendar where you know somebody's put in what they were doing on that particular day is great. And I'll end here. OK. 1937-38, um, there was a bubblegum card company in Philadelphia called Bowman Gum Inc. And don't ask me how, but they decided to do a series of trading cards called the Horrors of War. And it reportedly is the most popular, famous, non-sports series of cards ever produced in the United States, 288 cards. It focused largely on three conflicts, Sino-Japanese, uh, Italy and Abyssinia, or Ethiopia, and the Spanish Civil War, but primarily on the Sino-Japanese conflict. You have about 200 of these cards. It is a terrific teaching device. You could do a whole course, you know, of World War II, just using these cards. And the graphics are, it's pretty graphic. So the front side is the graphic. Card number one, Marco Polo Bridge, fittingly. Um, card 12, I just chose a few cards. I think that that is bloody... That's Bloody Saturday in Shanghai, when the Chinese planes, in order to either uh, reduce their load or they miss their target, which was the Izumo, which is the Japanese destroyer in Shanghai Harbor, their bombs dropped and killed thousands and thousands of civilians. And here, card number 17, we have, um, uh, what's her name? Uh, Wang Guimi, I think. 
And she was the girl guide, the girl scout, who at the end of the Battle of Shanghai, she took the Chinese flag, the ROC flag, across Su Chow Creek, I believe, to the defenders at the Sohong Warehouse. Because the Chinese had realized that the battle was lost, but they wanted to put a battalion of soldiers to keep the fight up till time's up. And she went across the bridge by foot, she swam back. And she is a hero on both sides of the strait. Okay, so I will stop there because we should have some Q&A. Yeah? Go ahead. Um, oh, and, you, the, and just... The girl guy just mentioned, I yeah. met her in uh, San Francisco. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. Uh, she was in her 80s, uh, and then she told me about this story. Wow. Said, wow, you make it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and here are the cards. <laughs> yeah, these are the cards. And you know, the interesting thing about this, Diana, is you know, these, these images are not unique to the U.S. We have similar images of the fight at the Sohong Warehouse, her, in Chinese cigarette carts. So, you know, these images were floating around the atmosphere. And it's just so interesting how um, historical events are transmitted. Yeah, you can do it, you know, through a, a school book. You can do it by word of mouth. You can also do it by something that's so, you know, visual. And I'm going up to Shanghai next week, and one of the places I'm going to go to is the Sohong Warehouse, for sure. Yeah, well, that's great that you met her. <laughs> yeah? Um. So you were saying that um, you had started with the older things, yeah. um, and I guess maybe you know, the typical canon. Could you um, maybe tell tell us a little bit about um, how you sort of branched out in into um, uh, ephemera and things like that? And maybe for some of the students, you know, how do you find these things? Because for a non-expert. Um, one wouldn't know where to begin to find a Pan Am uh, memorial bag. Well, a lot of it, a lot of it is online, and you make a lot of mistakes. You make a lot of mistakes. You pay a lot of tuition. So <laughs> no, you really, you do. Um, and I look at some of the early stuff that I collected, and even some later things that I've collected, and I go, mm, like, what was I thinking? Um, so in the beginning, I bought a lot from the few vendors who are here who deal in antiquarian materials. But now I would say I buy over 95% of my material uh, from outside Hong Kong. Um, in terms of why the ephemera, because it just moves me. It moves me in a way or animates me in a way that uh, a book, a straight book can't. I mean, books are great, and it doesn't mean that a book can't be ephemera or a pamphlet. So, for example, I recently was lucky enough to acquire, to acquire the January 1935, I'd never heard of it, NNN, Notes and Notices listing of foreign residents of Nanking. So, January 1935. So, any directory is prepared, you know, the year before in 34. So, I'm looking at it with a mind to 37 and 38, the massacre in that game. And I'm looking for names. And who do I see? I see John Robb, the good German, uh, who constructed the Nanking safety area. I see other people involved in the Nanking safety zone, uh, the Reverend McGee, and of course I see Minnie Boucher, the Jinling uh, American administrator who eventually killed herself because of, of what she underwent. I also see General von Falkenhausen. Von Falkenhausen was the primary German advisor to the KMT who constructed a lot of the strategy that went behind, you know, the pretty bitter fight that the Chinese put up in Shanghai. And you know, I, I look at that and then I think what happened, you know, two years later, and there's just a power, I think, at least for me, and not for everybody, because I know I'm nuts, you know, to be a com to be a collector. You have to be committed in both senses. You know, and, uh, I, I just left the loony bin. But um, there's just something about it here that I, I don't think a straight book, you know, would would necessarily have. Or, or talking about Nanking, there's a postcard 
There's a postcard from, so there were 13 Christian colleges. These are Protestant colleges, they're union colleges, so not denominational. So Jin Ling, um, uh, St. John's, Yenqing, Lingnan is the only surviving down here. Um, some very, very famous schools. For example, YMP was at St. John's. Um, so there was a postcard. There was a postcard that Jin Ling produced. So Jin Ling, there were only two of the 13 that were uh, all female. Uh, Huanan in Fuchao and uh, Jin Ling in Nanking. And there's a postcard. Uh, and Jin Ling's idea was to develop the whole person. So PE, physical education was very important. Uh, academics was very important. And the president of Jing Ling was a very famous person called Wu Yifang. And Wu Yifang was the only female signatory of the UN Charter for China in 1945, probably the second most famous female in China after Madame Shang, well, maybe third after Sun Jin Ling. Um, the most famous female in China outside of the Song family, let's put it that way. Um, and the postcard has, I think it's her, and she's surrounded by a, a group of girl students, and it says, Jin Ling College, uh, making China safe for women, or something like that. And you read that knowing what happened at Jin Ling seven years later. Yeah, they did make it safe -er for women in a time of absolute madness and slaughter. And you, you just want to cry. I mean, you literally want to cry. And uh, you just, it, it's stuff like that that can convey history with a, a punch to your gut, literally a punch to your viscera, in a way that I think other objects can't. So, long answer to your question. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for your presentation. Oh, thank you. Uh, you really show your excitement about what you do. And I want to ask you which advice would you give to a person who is just starting as a collector? Okay, what I would say is um, you got to ask yourself, do you have the staying power for it? And I, don't, I don't just mean monetary staying power. I think that collection or being a collector is in your DNA. You're born that way. I don't think, no, I don't think people acquire collectorhood. I, I think it is a genetic trait. I was a collector when I was a kid, speaking to other collectors. They, uh, now, maybe that's very broadly stated. But I think you have to stick with it, and you have to spend a lot of time every day. Because one thing about collections is, it's not just the collection that you see. It's all the stuff that you don't see that the collector passed over. Every day I'm looking at thousands and thousands and thousands of items, maybe really, really quickly, but I'm making editing decisions. Yes, no, yes, no. So it's all the stuff that you pass over. But the good news is that there are some very, like, I don't want to say stupid vendors out there, but um, there are some people who simply don't appreciate the worth of what they have. You know, they talk about the information age and you know the the perfect leveling of knowledge. It's not like that. So what I would say to you is, um, start, uh, try to work out a budget, saying I'm not going to spend so much more than so much per item, and then just start trolling. You know, you just have to keep on looking. Um, I wouldn't say like take a course on collecting, you know, on collecting 101 or 202. I think you just jump in, you make your mistakes. Uh, the mistakes are part. Uh, can I talk about a mistake? <laughs> no, I'll talk about a, well, it was like a partial mistake. Eileen Chang, the great, you know, short story, lust caution, whatever. I'm much more interested in historical stuff. I'm not as interested in fiction. I mean, I have some fiction. So there's a vendor in San Francisco, and they had on offer for $150 Eileen Chang's first English imprint. It was a collection of short stories. But what made this really special was that there were two letters that came with the book in which she is, I think, very character characteristically complaining about this thing and the other thing. <laughs> and the book was signed by her in English and with her child. So I saw it and went, wow, this looks good. 
150 bucks. And I showed up in San Francisco, I just happened to be in San Francisco, and uh, the vendor said to me, oh, Roy, you are so lucky. We mispriced this because someone from Mongolia called me and they were offering a thousand dollars. I said, "Wow, oh, okay." So I brought it back to Hong Kong, and I, you know, it just it didn't didn't have the emotional whatever. So I brought her around to a couple of dealers. Who said, oh. "And then I found this guy in Baoding, who has very very good stuff." And he says, "Oh, oh, uh, does, did she sign it? Does it have her chop?" Blah, blah, blah. He says, "How much do you want?" Okay. I said, "Oh." Uh, $2,000. He paid me $2,000. He said, she's my hero. We were born in the same province. And lo and behold, a couple of days later, he's listed it for $48,000. <laughs> so I was, I, I'm fine, you know. Uh, but and that's a very unusual, extreme story. And I'm not saying, you know, you're, you'd be in it to resell, or, although it's good to sell some things. I mean, I do sell some of my things, but fairly small. You just got to jump in. Just got to jump in, and, and you will be surprised at what you find. You know, you start off with your your marker. Okay, this is the area that I'm interested in, and you define it, and then you just you start looking. eBay obviously is a good place. If you um, um, if you speak in you know if you read Chinese, you can go to Confuzo, K O N G F Z. Although Confuzo sometimes there are payment issues, uh, I would go to the vendors. Who are here? Some of the dealers. There's Jonathan Wattis, uh, Marco can tell you, uh, Eve, French guy, uh, Lawrence Johnson. Just sort of familiarizing yourself. Um, but good luck. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as a curious to know, how did it? How did it all start? But I think you pretty much explained it that it comes in your genes, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> now I would like to know uh, how, like, what makes you keep going with it. Is there any point in your life uh, when you think, oh, I'm done with it, or something like that? Well, you know, that's a very interesting question. I had dinner uh, a couple of years ago with a guy named Philip Wickery. And Phil Wickery is a very smart, knowledgeable student of Chinese religious history. He is a minister. He is a Mandarin fluent guy. And he's written about some of the uh, transitional Christian leaders in China from the Kuomintang Republican era over the Communist era. Uh, I think this one guy, Bishop Ding, I think is his name. And um, he's now kind of the archivist for the um, Episcopalian church here, you know, St. John's and whatever. So he's the guy who keeps the records and goes out. So anyway, we're talking and we're having dinner in Jimmy's kitchen. And I turn to him and I say, you know, Phil, uh, for me, because I'm not a religious person, collecting is a little bit like religion. And he goes, oh, tell me about it. I said, yeah, it's like faith. You're on this road, and there are people on both sides of the road who are saying, you're nuts. What are you doing? You know, you're spending all the family's money. Um, and then you have not only the external sort of brickbats, but you have the internal doubt, like, you know, the insecurity that I talked about. And you're walking on this road and you have no idea where the journey is leading you. And I said, Phil, isn't that like faith? And he said, Roy, that's nothing like faith. <laughs> but, you know, it's, 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 not, it's not the easiest of, uh, of uh, obsessions. Not that any obsession is meant to be easy. Uh, I don't think I'll ever stop because even if I don't have one sue left in my name, I, there's so much I can do in sort of organizing. You know, if you ask me, how many Shanghai maps do you have? Or how many, I, you know, there's so, because like I said, I've been so focused on the acquiring side. I have not done a very good job on the cataloging, the archive, and I'm trying to do that. So it is a never ending thing. It's almost like you have this family, you know? You're, I've got three kids, three natural kids, but I've also got like 30,000 unnatural kids, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, so it, once you jump in, once you jump in, I think it's very difficult, very difficult, if you are truly, truly a committed collector to jump out. Now, I've had dealers say to me, you know, Roy, sell, you can sell the collection, maybe, 
just build another one. But then what you think about is the effort that you put in, which is absolutely immeasurable in terms of money. It's just the time and the joy and the frustration. So it's kind of a conundrum. But you're surrounded by people who say, you're nuts. What's your exit strategy? <laughs> you know, so as a business school proposition, for those of you who are you know, business school types, I understand that HKUST has more than a few. Yeah, it's probably not, you know, uh, and, and also you look at the external environment. Let's face it, Hong Kong is entering a period of historical amnesia, right? Hong Kong doesn't want to know about certain things in the past because it is, in a sense, parroting, aping the Chinese government. But the interesting thing is that the, in China, I think, they have a better understanding of where the lines are. So take Chiang Kai-shek. I think the, the PRC has a much, much different view of Chiang Kai-shek today than it did 20, 30 years ago. But you know, if in Hong Kong you want to suggest an exhibition about Chiang Kai-shek, like Tony Soprano would say, forget about it. <laughs> because here, people are starting to self-censor, I think, more than up there, where they kind of have a better idea of where the historical lines are. So yeah, I don't know if I've answered your question. I've sort of rambled. but. Yeah. Uh, thanks for your talk. A uh, quick question. As a collector, you said you buy a lot of things online. Yep. So I'm curious, how do you deal with the issue of, say, due diligence or problems or authenticity? OK, let's talk about authenticity. Ray, most of the things that I'm buying are not super expensive. Uh, so over the course of time, I would say that my unit price per purchase sounding you know, sort of very business school-like has gone significantly below $100. I mean, I've had some very expensive purchases. So you sort of have the fallback, and maybe it's not a correct fallback. Is anyone going to take their time you know, you know, duplicating something that, but then, then that doesn't mean that this thing that's less than $100 can't be worth 10, 20 times more than that, because the vendor simply doesn't um, uh, appreciate what the vendor has. <clears throat> so <clears throat> have I purchased some fake things? There probably are a few. I don't think that many. I'm not buying so old. You know, I'm mainly buying Republican era, you know, some late chain, uh, some 60s and 70s. I don't think that it's uh, that fertile ground for, you know, counterfeiters. The concern, I think, when you buy online, particularly from eBay, and I think more from Kung Fu, too, is quality. Uh, that the description is not complete. And you end up with something that's missing a page or two, or there's a tear, or, you know, I love some of these vendors who say, uh, I really don't know anything about this product. So totally, you know, caveat emptor, right? You know, buyer beware. Um, so not so much on authenticity or provenance, it's more on the issue of quality and then you know, logistics, it, it's crazy. You know, in the United States, where we both come from, you have vendors who are selling material about China and Hong Kong, but they won't ship outside the United States. <laughs> uh, now, maybe they had a bad experience, you know, with a PRC buyer, where they got screwed on payment or something like that, or the party just did a return. Who knows? So then you got to figure out, oh, geez, um, uh, where am I going to send this? So I have a friend in Connecticut and I have all that stuff sent to him. Or sometimes you run into vendors where the US shipping price is so much less than the Hong Kong shipping price, and you say, there's no accounting for this difference. So there are logistical issues, there are quality issues, but in terms of authenticity, yeah, not, that's not so big. I would think you know, when you're looking at maps and older things, yeah. Um, well, with maps, because we have a large uh, collection of Western printed maps of China. Now, even with maps that are fairly old, like 1600, right. 1700, as long as they are printed, up to now, maybe with 3D yeah. printing and so right. on, it might get edgy. But yeah. up to now, as long as they are printed, creating a fake printed map, even of 1700, 
tends to be more expensive than basically yeah. <laughs> having the real thing. Uh, but with manuscript maps, it's very different. Yeah. And with Chinese manuscript maps, that's really an issue that we are kind of very scared of, of even going there. Because if you don't, and then provenance is important. So well, who owned it? I, who certifies? Right. I, I, I didn't answer your question completely on provenance because I was thinking more on authenticity. Stuff gets stolen from libraries. Uh, stuff gets stolen from different repositories. So there's a very, very good bookstore in Pittsburgh called Caliban. Oh, yeah. And um, the owner of Caliban, the owner and founder, is a really good, and I bought stuff from them. He was conspiring with what library? Was it Frick or? Yeah, Mellon, maybe it was Mellon, Carnegie Mellon's library, and stole all sorts of stuff. So when that happens, then everybody has to sort of check as a dealer. I mean, I'm, I'm not a dealer, but you know, am I carrying anything from Caliban? Did I sell anything from Caliban? Um, and Yale, I mean, they have the guy at Yale who went in and he cut the maps out. Um, so libraries, I think, notoriously have, and Italy, well, Italy was mm -hmm. the, the, the biggest in one. In Naples. Yeah, uh, have notoriously crap. You know, security because you don't think of, you know, a library shouldn't be a place where you have you know, guards everywhere. But and there are some people who take advantage of that. You know, you also have an issue where you you buy something, and it has a library stamp, so it's described as ex library, but there may not be a withdrawn marker on it. And you you know, so I have something from um, an American, probably the most famous American in China in the 19th century, a guy named Gideon Nye. He was uh, a trader, he was a diplomat, he and his wife were buried in China, uh, NYE, Kitty and I, and I've always been looking for stuff and I got something. And there's a stamp, uh, University of New York or Albany, you know, I, I, so I don't know. You know, I bought it. Um, but, you know, you take your chances sometimes and uh, am I going to call up, you know, uh, NYE? No, but, you know, <laughs> you know but. But I think also, I mean, Roy brought his own item. So now it, it, it's the time is up. So if you want to leave, you leave. But I think it would be also okay. good if you can have maybe a look at, at some of these. Yeah, sure. Well, why don't, we, why don't we unroll this? This is right up his alley. Okay. <laughs>